Welcome to the 2018 Nathan Meyer Memorial Series in Bible Exposition. I realize for some of you this uh, introduction will be a repeat from yesterday, but we realize that many of you only come into school on Wednesdays, and so we want you to be aware uh, of the man for whom this series is named and also uh, to be aware of who will be speaking to us. Nathan Meyer was a Christian businessman in Dallas whose heart reflected Christ-like character qualities through servant-hearted leadership in the workplace. In addition to discipling other men, Mr. Meyer also helped many Dallas Seminary students make it through their years of study here by providing jobs for them. In 1997, Nathan's life was taken suddenly in an automobile accident. His friends and families wanted to honor his memory in a way that would remind others of his devotion to Christ and encourage them in their walk with the Lord. They established an endowment fund that would underwrite the annual DTS Fall Bible Conference and provide a tuition scholarship, now up to three or four tuition scholarships for a Dallas Seminary student. The Fall Bible Conference was renamed the Nathan D. Meyer Memorial Series in Bible Exposition. This year, we are honored to have Dr. Michael Easley as the featured speaker for this series. Michael Easley is the president and host of michaelincontext.com. His experience in ministry spans four decades as a gifted Bible teacher and church leader. During his time in ministry, Michael has pastored four churches, Grand Prairie Bible Church in Texas, Emmanuel Bible Church in Northern Virginia, Fellowship Bible Church in Nashville, Tennessee, and his current church plant of five or six weeks, Stonebridge Bible Church in the Nashville area. He also served as the eighth president of Moody Bible Institute in Chicago, Illinois. His desire to enter full-time ministry began when he was a college student at Stephen F. Austin State University. In order to prepare himself and learn more about God's word, he came here to Dallas Theological Seminary for his Master of Theology degree, returning later to complete his Doctor of Ministry degree as well. Dr. Easley married his wife, Cindy, in 1980. Cindy, where are you seated? Could you just uh, please stand up? Cindy, I know we're gonna embarrass you, but well. Thank you, Cindy. He married her in 1980, and they had together have four adult children. Dr. Michael Easley, we welcome you to the DTS campus. Let's give Michael a warm welcome. I write prayers. I learned years ago, uh, of course, accepting John Hanna when he prays, we all sort of take off our shoes. Um, I mean it. Um, but there are some of us that pray rote, uh, redundant, 15 synonyms. In fact, I will give you a dare today. I dare you when you break bread at lunch not to pray the prayer you've prayed the last 3,642 lunches. We are talking to the God of the universe. And yet for some reason we shoot from the hip when we pray. I wrote a prayer, I call it a preacher's petition. And rather than lead you in it, I want you to hear uh, over the years uh, my um, angst with preaching. Great God of the word who spoke creation into existence, who spoke covenants to men, who spoke laws of life, speak through the thick of tongue, the slow of mind, the dull of heart, the justified yet sinful soul. May I always know these are your people. May I always see sheep without a shepherd. May I see a blend of lost travelers, broken hearts, young in faith, and faithful servants. How could a man speak for God, when angels know better than to open their mouth with less than verbatim, how can a man for a lifetime help others know you? Even prophets were ignored and dismissed. How can a man explain the eternal? Even the apostle was thought a fool.
May I always be found in your text. May I always be grounded in your precepts. May I always be moored to your word. May I always be accused of teaching the scripture. Keep my head and heart toward you. Keep me in the world, but not of it. Help me never bore your people. Help me never breathe stale air from living language. Help me never pour brackish water when cool streams are nearby. If my life models anything, may it be a longing to be close to you. When my tour is over, when the last sermon endured, the last word said, may they remember you and your word. And may they always demand, sir, we would see Jesus. I wish I could brand that in your brain. You are stepping into a culture, whether you're going to be a pastor, a teacher, a missionary, an ESL worker, whatever you're going to be, this is no longer important. I mentioned yesterday what I call horizontal Christianity. We are more concerned with the I, me, my of life than the the value. And somewhere, somebody has got to take a stand. As our beloved Prof. Hendricks said, this is the word of God, and he did not stutter. And somewhere along the line, you have to be bold and courageous and kind and smile at the future, but do not be inoculated by this culture. This culture is beyond redemption. Individuals are not. The culture is beyond repair. People are not because we are made in God's image. And therein you are spending uh, two, three, four, eight, ten years to matriculate from Dallas, the logical seminary. And you will walk out of here with the rights and privileges therein. What does this mean? <laughs> to stand in front of some group of people, small or large, and say, Thus saith the Lord, not thus saith my agenda. May God deliver you from yourself. And the only thing I can encourage you with, as I mentioned yesterday, another cheery Michael Easley message. It will be only through pain you will learn these things. We do not grow in prosperity. We do not grow in success. We do not grow in ease. You may disagree. You'll learn one day. You only grow when it hurts. And that fulcrum of pressure, that angle of repose when God's word and life collide, you get to choose what you believe. The monastic period was marked with people who left ordinary callings and they went away into so, sort of an isolation community. Singing the Psalter became a part of their day. In fact, you know this far better than me. There were fixed psalms at certain hours. You might think of Gregorian or Roman chants. But these things had roots in the Psalter, the Hebrew song hymn book. As I noted yesterday, these were not just the top 40 or the top 150. They taught theology. They taught history through structure, through not English ear rhyme, but through repetition and devices that you have studied and are studying. They were unfolding a, a maze of information that you would do well to spend a bulk of your life knowing and memorizing. In the fifth century, St. Patrick of Ireland St. Marcius of Alcyon, the instructor of Charles the Great, repeated the entire Psalter every day. A knowledge of Psalter by heart was required for candidates for ordination. The Patriarch of Constantinople, St. Genetus, 458 A.D. and on, refused to ordain anyone who was not diligent to recite the Psalter. Gregory the Great inquired of Rusticus, who had been elected Bishop of Iconia, did he know the Psalter by heart? 
and he refused to allow John the Presbyter to be consecrated because of his ignorance of the Psalms. The Second Council of Nicaea, 587 AD, laid down that no one was to be consecrated bishop unless he knew the Psalter thoroughly. By the eighth century in Toledo, ordered that no one henceforth shall be promoted to any ecclesiastical dignity who does not perfectly know the entire Psalter. Let's start over at Dallas Seminary. You can't get in unless you can recite the Psalms 1 to 150 by heart. But we can pull out our little device and we can waste hours on end ruining our neuroplasticity with our thumb. You know what the number one hashtag in undergrad is today? TLDR. Too long, didn't read. Cindy and I have been mentoring young couples on and off for 20 some years. We bring them into our home for two years. We meet every Sunday night. We are abusive. <laughs> we expect them to do homework. We take them through Howard Hendricks' Living by the Book and Workbook. We take them through Paul N's Handbook of Theology. We used to take them through other ones, but they have a hard time reading that much. We make them memorize scripture. We do fill in the blank baby step books and then we graduate them. And by the half of the two-year program, I am meeting with these men one-on-one. -on -one. Cindy meets with the wives one-on-one. -on -one. And during this time period, uh, I say, okay, Chuck, you're going to lead the group next Sunday night, and I'll be glad to help you. And through that two-year process, one-on-one -on -one time, countless of hours. We say no to social events to host these young couples in our home. I will tell you, there's not a Sunday night that goes by that Cindy and I don't come home and dread having to get our house ready. Oh, I'm so tired. It's been a long week. We're so busy. I would just like to binge on Netflix, watch 76 episodes of some really important show. <laughs> and by the time those young couples break the threshold of our house, we are energized and engaged and delighted in the conversation that ensues. They, they have all sorts of names for me. I can't repeat in recording efforts, but um, uh, I, I am known as being direct. I will tell them what I think. We will vote differently. We will argue about things. But I am convinced the evangelical church has been building churches waiting for somebody else to make disciples. When Jesus Christ said, make disciples of all ethnos and I will build my church. And I would wire brush you until we got down to bloody tissue. Are you making disciples or building ministries? The master didn't equivocate. It's Pretty clear. Why do we make it so difficult? Make disciples of all ethnos, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. That's all for free. <laughs> Psalm chapter 15. If you have a real Bible, I commend you. If you have a fake click one, I condemn you <laughs> in a Christian sort of way. I love technology. I'm not against it. I just like to pull your chain. Are, am, I, am I among friends? Yes. About 12 of you. <laughs> Eight years ago, my father died on this day. I woke up this morning and saw it on my calendar. I said to my wife, wife, Cindy, my father died eight years ago today. What does that mean? What's a date on the calendar mean? So, that's for free too. Ever been invited to a black tie event? A formal? Uh, you may, depending on where you live and breathe, be invited to the White House someday. They do at random invite people for dinners. You may love or hate the current president, former or past, or future presidents. That's between you and your own business. But Cindy and I have been to the White House on many occasions, on Air Force One, on Marine One. We've been in and out of missile silos. We've done things that most people, most civilians never get to do. 
And when you're invited to such events, um, the first thing you do is you find out what you're expected to wear. Before I came here, I emailed Mark Yarborough, Dr. Yarborough, what do you wear in chapel these days? I'm used to wearing suits for 24 plus years. I went to Nashville and I showed up and they wore blue jeans and untucked shirts and maybe a sport coat for a real like you know, fancy event. And I was told after about four or five Sundays, Michael, you're wearing the wrong blue jeans. I didn't know there was such a thing as the wrong blue jeans. I thought my $21 Levi's were just fine. Even at 50 yards, they're just blue jeans. No, you're wearing the wrong blue jeans. And so I come to the Dallas Logical Seminary and I say, do I need to wear a coat and tie? And Mark says, no. He says, you can even untuck your shirt. If you come Friday, you'll see that. <laughs> when you go to the White House, you're expected to know how to dress. You're going to dress in laced up shoes and cuff links if you're a man. If you're a lady, not to be unkind or politically incorrect, forgive me for all that stuff, I can't keep up with it, uh, you're probably going to go buy a new dress. Guys rent tuxes, women buy new dresses, go figure, I don't know how that works. <laughs> and then they wear it once, I don't even want to talk about it. <laughs> you go to these events, they know more about you than you have any comprehension. You think Google knows about you, the White House knows about you. <laughs> a friend of mine was recently introduced to the vice president through a friend of a friend, and I called him and said, he doesn't answer his phone. And I said, when you see a 202 number on your phone, if you don't answer it, you're not going to get to meet these people. We lived there for 12 years. We still have a few strings. I said, if you want to meet them, you better answer your phone when that 202 rings. And when that 202 number rang, that by the way, disappears the moment you hang up. They know your social security number, your height, weight, your eye color, your cholesterol level, <laughs> and everything about you. Because you're about to walk into the most powerful building on the planet, and they want to make sure you're not a nut. And when you're invited to these black tie events, there's a certain protocol and behavior, and there's a lot of pomp and circumstance. Nixon was the one who played us like a drum as Christians. Nixon brought all these preacher types in in the Roosevelt room and they would come in and they would play them like fools and they would serve them with presidential china with the great seal on it. Would you like some coffee? Would you like cream in that coffee? The president's running a little bit late and every few minutes an aide would come in and everybody stands up. Well, he'll be here in just a few minutes. Uh, he's so sorry he's not. They're just pulling your leg. I was so sorry he's not here. It's all a game. And finally, when he arrives after the 30 or 40 minutes he was supposed to be there, he walks into the room and he's met by, uh, led by three or four entourage and they go, ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States, and I don't care if you like him or hate him, you stand up. And this thing fills the room and he shakes your hand and looks you in the eye and says things to you, puts his hand on your shoulder, so th thankful for what, I mean, he works the room in a whirlwind, he walks out of the room in five or six minutes, and you just met the President of the United States drinking coffee on presidential China. Whoop-de-doo. <laughs> Those evangelical leaders go home and they tell their church, I met with the President. Who weeks later, well, I talked to the president. Well, the president told me, and these stories become like a bad piece of roast beef. The more you chew them, the bigger they get. <laughs> when you have a protocol and you go somewhere important, there is a pretense with the way we look for some appearance or protocol sake when you approach the eternal God and Savior of your soul, how do you approach him? I would call this a theological black tie event. Psalm 15 is worshiping the one true king. O Lord, who may abide or sojourn in your tent? Who may dwell on your holy hill? You are seminary students. You go to that cemetery down there on Swiss Avenue. And so you know all these things. The parallels in this psalm are very easy to see. And the first couplet, who may abide, parallels who may dwell, who may abide in your tent, 
parallels, of course, on the holy hill. Remember, most of the Psalter was written prior to having a physical tabernacle complex, the temple complex. The portable version, which was in the wilderness, is what they were accustomed to. Of course, they knew the holy hill. Of course, they knew Zion. Of course, they knew this at some point was going to be seminal, whether it was from the time of Abraham and Isaac or the time of David and Solomon. They knew that would be the location, the physical center. This psalm is kind of a question and answer. Envision a gatekeeper who's talking to you with basically 10 questions to see if you can get in. If you're a Monty Python fan, you might remember, what's your favorite color? (laughs) Think of that from a political priest who's asking, I'm sorry, a male worshiper, as he has traveled north into or upwards, always go up to Israel, all Jerusalem, upward to the city. If you go to the old city, uh, you will see mikvahs. You know what a mikvah is? Do your homework. Uh, all these mikvahs uh, approach the southern steps. They have uncovered over 70 mikvahs. And there's theories about the number of steps down and out and whether they just had one in and out or two in and out and yada, yada, yada for you Hebrew scholars and archaeology fans. But the point of the matter was they stripped down to their inner ifid and they walked through the mikvah and they came up wet and clean. Then those men, sorry, those men got to go further and further into the complex and worship. It was a big deal. They looked forward to it more than we look forward to Thanksgiving, Christmas, and your granddaughter's birthday in one. They couldn't wait to go up to the, they sang these ascent psalms. They praised God as they walked the road and they went to worship Yahweh at his tabernacle, at his temple. The 10 qualifications of would-be worshipers would of course make our ear bend over to the 10 commandments, the Decalogue. And there are Old Testament scholars far brighter than me that try to mesh these together. I'm not that smart. I think these are standards of a sinner's struggle. These are the baselines of the kinds of things that would be a question and answer format. Are you ready to sacrificially come into the presence of Yahweh Elohim's complex and worship him? So, The psalmist continues with a mindset. A psalm of David, who may abide? Who can sojourn? Some of your Bibles dwell in your tent. Who may dwell on your holy hill? It's a simple outline. There's a question, there's an answer, and there's a pledge. Three points, no poem. There's a question and an answer and a pledge. The first question, who's qualified to worship God? Who's qualified to worship God? Again, the parallel, abide and dwell, tent and hill. Um, These were eager, sojourning pilgrims who could go up there and be part of this. You understand no one lived in the temple complex. Even the Levitical priest who served at the, quote, ministry, which just means service, right, in the Old Testament, we'll call them the wood and water haulers, the ones who dealt with sacrifice. Have you thought through the process of a sacrifice in some detail? This is a bloody, messy business. Any of you deer hunters? We're too politically correct for that here. We are in Texas, are we not? If you've ever killed a deer and field dressed an animal of that size, um, you're going to have a little bit of stuff on your person. Even if you have all the accoutrements of modern technology and hunting today, you're going to be a bloody mess. Imagine doing... Not one, not two, but dozens of animals with basins of water, not faucets of water, to wash off that blood. And in God's great sense of humor, white ephods. (laughs) No universal precaution suit, a white ephod. Talk about a bloody, difficult mess to manage as priests. And so these workers of the complex basically were squatters in renters' quarters around the complex. Nobody lived there. Only one was holy enough to dwell. Yahweh's presence. Not literally the way we think, but that was the the picture the worshiper was given. 
The tent complex is an important imagery that no matter how hard man worked, the best he could do was come up with a shell. When God gave Moses in the, in the um, original Levitical orders of how to build the temple complex, the ornate parts of the mobile tabernacle versus the temple that Solomon would later construct. Uh, tent and hill are probably figurative of Mount Zion. Again, if you've not been there, uh, I have another uh, ax to grind. If you're going to teach the Bible to people, you better go to Israel before you start teaching the Bible. Cindy and I have been many, many, many times. First time I ever went was with Dr. John Hanna. And we took a group from our, one of our churches. And I've been back many, many, many times. And le we'll lead two groups this coming year uh, going to Israel. Because until you're on the Sea of Galilee, don't tell illustrations about the Sea of Galilee. You'll be wrong. Until you stand on Mount Moriah, you won't understand the plateau. And still you see the Dome of the Rock and the al Osk Mosque, you will not understand what's going on over there from a political, religious standpoint. Until you get to know four or five rabbis. You know the joke is, if you ask four or five rabbis an opinion, you'll get at least five or six or seven or eight. And they don't agree on anything. In this small country, smaller than the state of Connecticut, there are more divisions and opinions on parts of the land than there are in American political landscape on who or who it should be in the office. It's a remarkable country, and it's where this book, Why God Chose That Little Sliver of Land to Introduce Himself to Us, you can work on that on your spare time. Who meets such demanding qualifications? When was the last time when you opened your Bible, or if you, this is how you do your devotions, and you stopped, and you said, I am about to converse with the God of the universe. in the game who, who can do this who can ascend to the hill who can do these things that's why I hate technology I had a cabinet officer when I was at the Moody Bible Institute and he was a businessman before he had cashed in and come to help the Institute a brilliant man Brilliant in finance, brilliant in his f former career. Uh, a little more business than Christian. A little more business than ministry. But you need those kinds of people in a 125-year-old organization with uh, 800 employees and 23 contiguous acres in downtown Chicago. And he was another wire brush friend of mine. He would wire brush me all the time. We'd have these big important meetings and of course everybody's got an opinion, everybody's willing to arm wrestle that they're right and you're wrong and of course you as the leader get to make the decision. Fun. Looks good from one side and I would say it's always unfair to do this. Let's pray about this. Oh gosh. I don't want, and they know I don't want pablum prayers. And this guy who made so much money in the corporate world would begin to pray. And it was as if this rough exterior bully of a Chicago boy turned into a sweet, humble, gentle, I'm talking to God. I love the way he prayed. It was from the heart, no pretense, no seminary degree, no Bible college degree. But when he talked to God, he really believed he was talking to God. And this is why it pains me when you and I, I am not above this, say the same palaver over the same meal two or three times a day. The question, who's qualified? He begins the answer in verse 2. He who walks with integrity and works righteousness and speaks truth in his heart. The simple answer is only the righteous can draw near to God. You know this. And these ten qualifications then are enumerated. I will go through them very quickly. The first I would put under the umbrella of righteous integrity. Walks with integrity. You know walk in the Old Testament is a, a metaphor of lifestyle. If you haven't studied halak in your Proverbs and Psalter and other way it's used, it's simply one foot in front of the other of life. It's just the walk of life. He who walks with integrity. Integrity is our word tamim. 
I memorized Psalm 101 years ago. He who walks within, walks within my house in the integrity of my heart, I will set no worthless thing before my eyes. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not fasten its grip upon me. I will walk within my house in the integrity of my heart. I would argue Psalm 101 was sort of a monarch or inaugural psalter as for me and my house song that David may well have written when he became king. Can't prove it. Dr. Chisholm and others can prove me wrong. He wrote this song as an inaugural idea. I'm gonna walk within my house in integrity. I will set no worthless thing before my eyes. What was David doing on the roof looking at whom? And this is my fear. I will set no worthless thing before my eyes. I was talking to an academic uh, this week on the plane. UCLA has just instituted a policy. This, tablets, and computers, can't bring them to the classroom. You bring a notebook and a textbook. And that's the left coast, baby. <laughs> if the left coast is taking the lead in neuroplasticity and what this stuff is doing to our head, I will set no worthless thing before my eyes. A friend of mine's a law instructor. He says, Michael, I wander to the classroom and I lecture. And I see students all on their MacBooks and their iPhones. And they're answering messages and looking at Facebook and Instagram. And they're not paying any attention to what I'm saying the entire class. I'm not anti-technology. I love it. I use Logos every day of my life. I was an early adopter. I don't know how I would do it with books anymore. I got 85 books at the click. I can go to Kittle in one click. 100 years ago, I had to start with the last volume. And we had the quadrants, A, B, C, and D, reading things I couldn't even understand. They expect me to know all those other languages. I just want to know what Galatians 4.4 meant. <laughs> I don't want to spend an hour and a half chasing it around in seven volumes, looking up the ep epi preposition. I mean, I would just know what it means, right? <laughs> Give me the gold. Right click, Lagos, boom, I'm in bag, I'm in Kittle, I'm in BDB, I'm wherever I want to be. I love technology. But David says, I will set no worthless thing before my eyes. I have defined integrity, and people disagree with me all the time, I'm used to it. I've defined integrity, not what you do when you're alone, but also what you think about and the privacy of your mind. Indivisible is what the English word means. So when you and I are noodling away, when our mind drifts and goes off to subjects, you know, we, we call it ADD. I just call it poor self-control. I was ADHD before they had such labels. I still are M1. My desks face a wall. I always marvel at people that have these big wi windows and vistas because I see not only squirrels, I see everything and I can't get a thing done. I must shut down Outlook and Gmail and everything and have Word and Logos and Bibles and some of the commentaries that aren't yet digital on my desk only. I'm not saying you have to do that. That's my struggle because the privacy of my mind will take me all kinds of crazy places. You sit in a church and you look around the room, you sit in this chapel experience and you're looking around the room for other people's reactions. Integrity is the ability to say, by self-control and Holy Spirit's control, I will walk within my house in the integer, the indivisibleness of my heart and set in a worthless thing before my eyes, the gateway. He moves then from working righteousness, Sadiq or Sadiq, depending on how you want to pronounce it, morally and ethically right. Why do we like shows like Law and Order and, and criminal shows and serial shows and what's the, what's the podcast everyone's addicted to about the guy that went to jail and maybe or maybe not he's guilty, yeah, whatever. Um, God bless you. Um, why do we like those shows? There's something innate in the heart of man that wants righteousness. He or she wants justice. Wouldn't it be great if every judge, man or woman, who sat in a courtroom over a jury trial or just a judgment trial always judged rightly? They did the right thing in the right way and they sent the, the, the victims were exonerated and the guilty was charged. 
Yes, that's what we want to see in life. It doesn't always work out that way. I would argue something in the heart of even fallen, corrupt, sinful man like me. I want justice. I want righteousness. And that to me is what the psalmist is saying. You start with integrity, it works into righteousness, and then he speaks truth. Interesting how our English translations fumble with this. I looked at you know, ESV, Net Bible. I have to look at Net Bible because I'm at Dallas Seminary. I looked at Net Bible, looked at NSB, looked at Holman, I looked at Holman Christian Standard, CSB. Uh, a lot of them say, in his heart, he speaks truth in his heart. Some gloss it to he speaks truth from his heart. The preposition doesn't help me. I don't know what the answer is. I've, I've concluded it's left a little bit generic for a good reason. What's our culture view about truth? What's true for you. I remember one of my daughters coming home from high school many, many years ago, and we were debating the whole LGBTQ thing, and that, that day it wasn't called that, but LGBTQI fill in the blank, as I often say, wait for the next letter to come. I know people are struggling. I'm not mad at them. I just, I think it's a fascinating argument. And, and she comes home from school, and we had this discussion about some kids in her class, and, and she said, well, Dad, they're made that way. I said, Okay, let's talk through that. And then the conversation went, well, it's what's true for you, and you have to be true to yourself. And I didn't say this to a high school child, but I thought to myself, how do we teach people being true to yourself is a false index? Because yourself is co-opted and corrupted and depraved. There's no true to yourself. That's why I'm going to encourage you you won't like me when I leave. That's okay. I leave and that's fine. This is truth. I don't care what the culture says. I'm not mad at the culture. Culture's hurting, twisted, ingrown, ingratiating. This is black and white. Ah, even that's politically incorrect today. What's true in your own heart is malarkey. That's the Hebrew word. <laughs> he speaks truth. And I would take the derivatives of the Hebrew words to say the heart. Of course, the Hebrew didn't talk about the heart the way the Greek did. You all know that. But the idea was the centerpiece, the loci of the man or the woman was the center. And if I tie these together from integrity and righteousness and truth, I start to see a pattern. That the whole of what you and I believe, I wish I could get on my knees and beg you if it would make a difference. You're at Dallas Theological Seminary. My God, people, if you don't get this right, who's going to? You, you have the privilege of paying lots of money <laughs> for good men when them to make you do things you'd never do on your own. That's all education is. Think about it. You'd never do this without paying someone and having a deadline. That's all education is. Your faculty get to live because you pay a salary to them. I like it. Works out. They taught me to do things I would have never done had they not made me. Don't get so culturally minded you've left the Bible. Only the righteous can draw near to God. Three, he does not slander with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his friend. I would put these qualifications as not hurtful. As the list continues, not slander. We're not going to speak ill of a person. We're not going to gossip. Gossip is a funny thing. Uh, one of my friends in Middle Tennessee employs about 800 people, and he will fire you for gossip one time. They teach you on your orientation and to work for him, for their company. He's very clear about it. You gossip, you're fired. That'll clean your sinuses. <laughs> you gossip, you're fired. And so I said, how do you define gossip? He goes, Complaining laterally or down. Complaining laterally or down. You complain up. 
You do not complain laterally or down. You go to your superior. You go to the man or woman to whom you report. And you say, I have a question. And you think through what you're going to say and how you're going to say it. But if you gossip, we're going to fire you. Because I will not have a culture that gossips. Either you like that or you don't. I like it. Not slander, not gospel. No evil. The Old Testament term returns to anything that causes harm or pain. Nor reproach, the idea of a taunt or a disgrace or a critical attack. I mentioned yesterday, one of the things God has hammered me over my lifetime has been, I have a very critical spirit. I can meet you and I have this discerning thing and it's sort of a blessing and a curse. Cindy and I will go out with a couple, meet them for the first time perhaps, have a meal with them, and we'll get in the car and she'll look at me and I'll look at her and like, who goes first? How are we gonna debrief about this couple we just met? Not trying to be gossips or critical, but there's just something that doesn't smell quite right in that relationship. I don't know what it is. We're not mad at them. We get to spend more time with them, more time with them, and you know what? Often that discerning thing is true. There's something there that you and I can smell and see, but I can't become a critic and look down on people. Here's the irony for me. I'm reluctant to speak the truth to a person, but I'm ready to gossip about it to somebody I hardly know. You? Who can worship? Who can come into the temple complex, the tabernacle complex, and worship God? Not slander, no evil, no reproach. Only the righteous can draw near to God. Verse four, in whose eyes a reprobate, a vile person, is despised. But who honors and fears the Lord, he swears by his own hurt and does not change. He despises the reprobate and honors the godly. Time has evaporated. Yesterday I thought I went to 1140. I got the 20 and 40 mixed up, forgive me. And now I'm over again. All these outside preachers. I love going to my African-American friend's church when he always tells me, take as long as you like, preacher. (laughs) Never tell a white boy, take as long as you like. He despises the reprobate, he honors the godly, he keeps his word, he swears to his own hurt, and he does not change. In a word, he's faithful. Verse five, he does not put out his money at an interest, nor does he take a bribe. I find it almost comical that the last point is talking about money. We started with integrity and now we're talking about finances. Uh, Finally, let's jump to the end. He He who does these things will never be shaken. The list quickly, walks with integrity, works righteousness, speaks truth, does not slander, no evil, no reproach, despises the reprobate but honors the godly, keeps his word even if it hurts him, and he doesn't take money at an interest nor a bribe. Two quick lessons. Number one, don't minimize your sin. Don't minimize your sin. Don't toy around with it. Don't judge your sin against someone else who has a worse sin. As I mentioned yesterday, the ground at Calvary is level. I'm not any better than you. You're not any better than me. You might be smarter than me. You might be better looking than me. You might be younger than me. You might be happier than me. That's not real hard. A lot of things, you might be better at me. You know what? At Calvary, we're sinners saved by grace. Do not toy around with the defining of your sin. What you think affects your heart. What you look at affects your heart. The way you view people affects. In recent days, Cindy and I had conversations with people, and you're all, if, you ha- if you haven't been attacked and criticized, you must not be fogging a mirror. Because if you're doing anything, you're gonna be attacked and criticized. And how you handle that is all the chapter and joy of life to figure it out. And something that changed my heart toward people that I don't like Sometimes I think they're just taking good air. It's to see them as image bearers of Jesus Christ who are hurt, who are angry, who are broken, and they're no better than me. More importantly, I'm no better than them. Because the moment I think I'm better than them, I'm down the wrong road, 
and my sin is more egregious than the one I am pointing out. Never minimize your sin. On the other side, only a perfect person can approach God. We're toast. We're toast. Only a perfect person can approach God. Now, I've read oodles of commentaries on Psalm 15, and here's my, here's my, my uh, thin ice heresy, what I'm gonna tell you. Most commentators say these 10 things are like a Q&A for, think about it as you go liturgically to worship at the temple complex, to think about these areas, slandering, righteousness, so forth and so on, and check in a box before you go up the hill, which sounds just like the law to me. And I'm not saying that, was, that wasn't the way it was used, but it occurs to me, the way the psalmist begins is who can worship? And the answer is only somebody who's perfect. And you know what? I only know one person who's perfect. I think it's a messianic overture. I think the psalm is telling me the only way you and I can approach up worship is if we're on the coattails of somebody who's perfect. In Christ, abiding in him. Only way I'm gonna get there. When I was here at Dallas Seminary, uh, Charlie Boyd, John Pitt, and I hung around a lot. Dr. Hendricks affectionately called us the unholy trinity. We were known for being rabble rousers. John Hanna is more gracious, but he could tell you stories about how difficult a student I was, as could a number of professors that I had in this room. And we were always causing trouble. And uh, Charlie would go home and take, let's say, 15, 20 pages of notes from Dr. Hanna. We didn't have laptops in those days. The Macintosh box was the computer that Charlie Dyer and John Martin brought on campus that weighed 84 pounds in these things. These, they, they were geeks before geeks were cool. And um, we didn't have notebook computers. We had pen and pads. You know, we walked uphill in the heat both ways to seminary. <laughs> Dr. Hannah would wax eloquent, and the three of us would take notes as feverishly as we could to get every little gem and Hannahism we could capture. And we'd come out exhausted and I didn't want to go home and take a nap. And uh, Charlie would go home and he would type up all those notes. And then he would make what we dubbed the Charlie chart. He would take an eight and a half by 11 horizontal uh, landscape, forgive me, uh, uh, format. And he would draw a chart of Anselm or whatever nonsense it was we had to know. And we would meet at Jack in the Box at 7 a.m. on Tuesday and McDonald's on Wednesday. That's all there was. Jack in the Box, McDonald's. Equally bad, we just opt, you know, opted the coffee. <laughs> and we would sit there and review the notes and talk through them. And we would read Charlie's chart. And I, I, after a while, I realized I, I don't have to work that hard anymore. I'm just going to look at the Charlie chart at 7 in the morning and I'll make a B. Now, that's not true, but my point simply is I was riding on his coattails. He was the guy that was smarter than me, 4.0 through Dallas, one of the few in those days. And, um, you know, I got through because these guys were tired of me. And they wanted me out of here. I was in irritation. And fast forward, I love that picture because you and I are getting to worship Christ on Christ's coattails. You're perfect in Christ. Who can worship? Only one person I know. And you and I, who trusted Christ, who followed him, who believe in him, who acknowledge him as our Lord and Savior, we dovetail into, and Paul will spend how much ink? In Christ, in Christ Jesus, in Christ. As I said yesterday, I think our future is Christology, not ecclesiology. Father, thank you for these men and women, for their patience and their time. It is your word, not ours. Help us. In Jesus' name, amen.